Hi again. Okay, so here we go with the adrenal gland. So we are leaving the anterior, uh, I mean, we've, we're continuing with the anterior pituitary uh, and endocrine axis. So we've talked about the anterior pituitary and how that releases growth hormone. We talked about the anterior pituitary and how it uh, releases thyroid stimulating hormone, which goes to the thyroid. So now we're going to talk about the uh, adrenal gland and those relationships with the pituitary as well. So uh, again, you're going to have lab videos that show you more about the glands and where they're found and what their histology looks like. But just so you understand where we are, all right, so let me, there we go. Uh, the adrenals are also called your suprarenal glands, uh, and that's because they're above the kidneys. And so if you look at the kidneys, uh, you will see uh, that you have these triangular shaped organs above them. So renal means kidney and ad means basically above. So supra, above, renal. So the glands above the kidneys. And so you have two of them, a left and a right, and they're these pyramid shaped organs that just sit right on top of the kidney. And they're actually two separate glands, or you want to use, or maybe even four. So there's two glands on the right and a uh, uh, I mean on the left and then two glands on the right, I have to do my anatomical. Uh, so you actually have, these are, these are glands, there are actually two glands in one, okay? Uh, and so when you look at these glands, they have an outside and an inside. And I'm not sure how much of this you remember, maybe from uh, central nervous system, how the brain has a cerebral cortex and you have the cerebral medulla or the cerebellum has a cerebellar cortex, cerebellar medulla. So whenever you talk about the outside, you say cortex, and inside, you say medulla. So if you look at this, uh, here, this kind of beige area is your adrenal cortex, and this colored area in the middle is the adrenal medulla, okay? And so the cortex, um, it actually acts as kind of three separate endocrine organs in and of itself. It has three layers of glandular tissue, and each one of those layers does its own thing, okay? So the cortex has a set of um, hormones that it produces, and then the medulla has a set of things it produces, okay? So we're going to talk about the cortex and the medulla and talk about each one of the hormones produced in each place and what their job is, okay? So again, think about that hypothalamic axis. You have your hypo, uh hypothalamus up here, and it's going to um, stimulate uh, the um, anterior pituitary to release ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone. So hopefully what you're seeing there is this part of the lecture, I'm talking about what's going on in the cortex, adrenocorticotropic. So the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary making ACTH, going to the cortex of the, um, of the adrenal gland. All right, so this uh, adrenal gland is going to secrete aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. All right, we're going to talk about each one of those and where they're made. All right, so the adrenal cortex, if you look at it, you have three layers that we call zones. You have the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. Um, the zona glomerulosa makes your mineralocorticoids, okay, an example of that are going to be your aldosterones. So mineral, um, so aldosterone, so it's going to have something to do with sodium, minerals, okay? The glucocorticoids, examples cortisol, has something to do with uh, glucose metabolism, and we'll talk about that. And gonadocorticoids, gonads, has something to do with sex hormones, okay? So this is what this looks like in, uh, if you were to break down these uh, layers, these zones of the adrenal cortex. You have the zona glomerulosa here. And glomerular, it means uh, kind of ball shaped. So it's this layer of ball shaped structures. It looks very much like that, the little balls. And it gets its name because it looks like the glomeruli uh, of the kidney, which are round type structures. You have the zona fasciculata. And these are fascicles, so think about, think about the muscles, so long, straight uh, uh, bands, so these are, are fascicles, kind of look like icicles. That's how I tell my students in, in the classroom, like fasciculata, think icicles, they kind of hang down like icicles. And so this is for cortisol and androgens, the glomerulosa is for aldosterone. And then the zona reticularis is uh, just deep to that. 
And so uh, reticular means web-like, so it's just kind of this web-like region, okay? And then if you go down even further into the medulla, this is retinal medulla, and this is where epinephrine and norepinephrine are made, okay? So again, we'll talk more about this in your lab portion as well. But these are your zones and what's made in each zone. So what are the mineralocorticoids? These are things that regulate minerals, so electrolytes, okay? So regulation of electrolytes. Primarily sodium and potassium, and what we're talking about is how much sodium and potassium we have in our extracellular fluid. Okay, so why is it important uh, to regulate sodium? Well, we know that if you change sodium levels, it can affect extracellular fluid volumes, uh, which can also affect blood volumes. If you change blood volumes, you can change blood pressure, and some uh, has some um, effects on other ions as well. Uh, what about potassium? Uh, you have to make sure your potassium is regulated because it's very important in setting that resting membrane potential of cells. Uh, remember, you have to have a, have a resting membrane potential to get an action potential. So electrolytes are very important for a lot of different reasons. And uh, aldosterone is the most important one, okay? And what it does is it allows uh, cause st or stimulates sodium reabsorption and Thereby, if you hold on to sodium, water follows sodium, you retain water in the kidneys. Okay, so aldosterone, the target is going to be the kidneys where you hold on to sodium and then also hold on, reabsorb sodium and then hold on to water. So how do we regulate aldosterone secretion? Uh, it's part of the renin-angiotensin system. So I think you probably had a little bit of that when you talked about blood pressure um, in the heart. Uh, so if you have a deep increased blood pressure, so blood pressure is falling, that will cause the kidneys to release renin. And then renin will trigger the formation of angiotensin II, which is a stimulator of aldosterone. So that's going to cause the release of aldosterone. So think about it. Aldosterone causes you to, resorb, to reabsorb sodium. Hold on to water. What would, what, would, what would blood pressure do? It would go back up. So a stimulus of falling blood pressure, if you start to hold on to sodium and uh, water, your blood pressure will rise. Um, if you have high levels of potassium, all right, that will cause the uh, zone of glomerul uh, glomerulosa to directly release aldosterone. All right? so think of that as a humoral response. So the, the zona um, glomerulosa responds to high levels of um, potassium by, by producing um, aldosterone. ACTH. This is, um, causes small uh, amounts of aldosterone to be released during uh, stress. Uh, and ANP, which is atrial natriuretic peptide. So that natriuretic, that stands for sodium. Remember, the real word for sodium is natrium. We just, um, instead of, the old word is natrium instead of sodium. So that's where we get the NA from. So this is actually a hormone made by the heart. And uh, it will block the renin, um, and uh, renin and aldosterone secretion and decrease blood pressure, okay? So that's what ANP does. So let's talk about um, some factors that will allow you to increase your blood pressure. So this is what we want. This is our goal, to increase blood pressure, all right? So what stimuli can we, uh, can we have that will result in an increased blood pressure, all right? Well, if you have a low blood pressure, then obviously the, res the response you want is a higher blood pressure. So a primary regulator would be a drop in blood pressure, and that's going to be the kidneys are going to respond by uh, releasing renin, all right, which is going to release angiotensin II, and I think we've already gone over that uh, in the heart, so you should remember that. That is going to cause the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex all right, to secrete aldosterone, uh, and that's going to target the tubules of the kidney, increase sodium reabsorption, and then water reabsorption, and increase blood pressure. Too much potassium in the blood, that will directly stimulate, not through any cascade, directly tells the glomerulosa, we need some more aldosterone. Same effect. Hold on to sodium, hold on to water, increase blood pressure. What about stress? Uh, so if you have stress, and so these are, think about emotional stress, uh, the hypothalamus is going to tell the um, anterior pituitary to release ACTH. Uh, remember the 
releasing hormones, corticotropic releasing hormone. Don't forget about that. You got to remember what the hypothalamus, which inhibiting and releasing hormones, the hypothalamus uh, releases. So it's going to release CRH, which is going to have the anterior pituitary release ACTH. That's going to target the zona glomerulosa. Same thing. You're going to get aldosterone, hold on to sodium, hold on to water, high blood pressure. What if you have high blood pressure? We have a high blood pressure. What's going to happen? If your blood pressure is already high, do you want to hold on to more water? Do you want to hold on to more sodium? Do you want to increase your blood volume? No. So if you have a high blood pressure, one of the ways you can uh, combat that is to release atrial natriuretic peptide from the heart, and it inhibits the zona glomerulosa. So it prevents the zona glomerulosa from uh, secreting aldosterone. And so therefore, you, you let sodium go. Water follows that sodium. Blood volume goes down. Blood pressure goes down. Okay? Uh, obviously, I love these kind of pictures that have everything on it. And these are where I, a lot of times I get those all that apply <laughs> type of questions. Uh, this is really good because it's bringing in more than just one system. We're not talking about just the uh, endocrine system. We're also talking about the renal system. We're talking about high blood pressure uh, and its control. Okay, and also electrolytes. So there's lots of good stuff going on uh, in this particular slide. All right, so what happens if uh, you have too much, too little? Hypersecretion is called aldosteronism, uh, usually a tumor. And so you're gonna wind up with hypertension uh, and edema. Uh, swelling because you're holding on to too much sodium and so too much water is going to cause your blood pressure to go up and um, cause you to have swelling. Uh, it also causes you to get rid of uh, too much potassium and that can lead to some al abnormal functioning. Remember you don't you can't uh, maintain your resting membrane potential and that should I'm not sure where the rest of that went. <laughs> uh, so I'll just type it in for you. All right uh, so we've done aldosterone. So what about cortisol? These are your glucocorticoids. And these are used to help your body adapt to intermittent food, food intake. So most of us eat, you know, three main meals a day and then snack throughout the day. But uh, we need to maintain our sugar levels all throughout the day. We don't want to have per two periods of too high and too low that we can't function because our sugar's, you know, too low. So these uh, glucocorticoids or cortisols allow us to uh, maintain blood sugar levels pretty constant throughout the day. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of uh, insulin and glucagon uh, also that play a role in sugar uh, regulation, but right now I just want to focus on cortisol which helps us kind of maintain that uh, kind of an even sodium um, sugar, blood sugar all day long. Um, it also works as a vaso uh, by increasing the action of vasoconstrictors, so we use it to uh, maintain blood pressure. Um, it's the most significant glucocorticoid, just like aldosterone was the most significant mineralocorticoid. Uh, it too is released in response to ACTH. So then you have the hypothalamus, then CRH, and then the, uh, adre the adrenal, the, I'm uh, sorry, anterior pituitary releases ACTH. And um, it's going to be released in uh, patterns that kind of mimic your daily eating activity and uh, stress levels, okay? And its main job is gluconeogenesis. Okay, gluconeogenesis, which is genesis means to form, gluco as in sugar. So the formation of glucose uh, from fats and proteins. So again, if you haven't seen cellular respiration and all the, the alternate forms of making uh, ATP, you might want to go back and kind of think about the different ways of, um, of doing that. But gluconeogenesis allows you to uh, basically turn fat and protein into sugar. So this will uh, help raise um, blood sugar, fatty acids, and amino acids in your blood. Okay, so that's cortisol. Uh, what happens if you have too much, too little? Too much hypersecretion is known as Cushing's. Okay, and uh, one of the things you'll see is a depression in the cartilage and bone formation. Uh, it'll have some inflammatory problems, uh, so inhibits inhib inhi inhibition of inflammation, uh, a depressed uh, nervous system, uh, changes in cardiovascular, neural, gastrointestinal function. So uh, those are all symptoms of Cushing's. Hyposecretion, Addison's disease. Uh, this um, also involves a deficit in mineralocorticoids. So 
not only glucocorticoids, but also mineralic corticoids. You don't have enough of either one. So you have uh, decreased levels of glucose and sodium. These people have weight loss, dehydration, hypotension. And also, a lot of times, kind of a, a bronzy cast. Uh, there's a precursor hormone. Uh, and so if you have this problem, uh, if you're having Addison's disease, you also have a precursor hormone that causes you to overstimulate uh, MSH. Do you remember melanocyte stimulating hormone? So a lot of times people with Addison's will have a lot of MSH uh, and they'll look kind of bronzy, like they have a, a tan. Uh, and you can go on the internet. Uh, John F. Kennedy, the president, had Addison's. So there's a lot of interesting things to go on the internet and read about uh, Addison's disease. Um, one thing about Cushing's is uh, because uh, they kind of cause you to have an abnormal storage of fat and so with uh, uh, Cushing's disease a lot of times you'll see this pronounced uh, buffalo hump. It's kind of a fat pad that occurs on the upper back. And that's pretty. And you also kind of see swelling, uh, kind of a moon face in these uh, patients. Alright, so now the gonadocorticoids. Uh, your sex hormones. Uh, most of these are androgens, which are male hormones, uh, and so these are then converted into testosterone and estrogen. All right. Uh, uh, so it's converted to testosterone in um, uh, or estrogen in females in the reproductive tissue. So you make these androgens and you convert them to either testosterone or estrogen um, as needed. Um, there's thought that they can contribute to the onset of puberty. Uh, they may play a role in the appearance of secondary sex characteristics. Uh, you haven't had reproduction yet, but what that means like facial hair, uh, things like that, axillary hair, things, things that you started to notice uh, when you started to go through puberty, uh, breast buds, things like that, also t uh, sex drive. So you have some sex hormones that don't necessarily come from the testes and ovaries. You have some that come from the adrenal glands. So you may see uh, there are s some um, uh, problems with uh, hypo and hypersecretion of the gonadocorticoids. And so if you have too much, it's called adrenogenital syndrome. Um, so in adult males, if you have a hypersecretion, it's not too big of a deal because you've already masculinized if you're an adult male, so you don't really see anything. But in a young male, uh, you're going to see these secondary sex characteristics develop uh, prematurely. So you may see a four or five year old boy with, uh, with hair under their arms uh, and things like that. In young females, uh, again, these are androgens or male hormones, and so they tend to cause uh, facial hair like a, a beard, uh, masculine body hair, an enlarged clitoris, which is the uh, homologue to the male penis, it's the same tissue. Uh, so you'll see kind of the males be, I mean the females look kind of masculinized because they have too much of this hormone. All right, um, so the adrenal medulla, we've talked about the cortex, so this other gland within a gland, the medulla, or medulla, either way, you can say it either way. Um, these uh, have chromaffin cells and they make your catecholamines. And the catecholamines are going to be your epinephrine and your norepinephrine. And sometimes you'll hear these called um, um, adrenaline and noradrenaline uh, because they're from the adrenal gland. So you may have heard those terms before. Uh, what do these hormones do? You should know because they, they do the same thing that the neurotransmitters, epinephrine and, and norepinephrine do. They cause blood sugar levels to rise, blood vessels to constrict, your heart to beat faster, you divert uh, blood to your brain, heart and skeletal system. So those sympathetic things that happen in the nervous system, that's what these adrenal uh, uh, medullary uh, hormones do. All right, so they're going to act like the sympathetic nervous system. So these hormones uh, both exert the same effect, but um, each one of them is better at certain things. Okay, so they're they're both stimulatory. But epinephrine is particularly good at uh, metabolic activities, dilating the bronchioles, uh, and bron the, this bronchial dilation. Uh, increasing blood flow to the skeleton and the heart, whereas norepinephrine is uh, better at, um, more effective at peripheral vasoconstriction and uh, blood pressure uh, changes. Okay, so they, they both do things uh, that would work, would work uh, toward a sympathetic response, but they kind of um, specialize in different things. 
So when you think about sympathetic nervous system, uh, you're thinking stress. Okay, so um, what would happen in short-term stress versus long-term stress? All right, so let's just kind of go through and talk about what could happen. So short-term stress, uh, let's, I like to use uh, this one where uh, you're lifting a bus off of somebody. Okay, so we know that that's a stressful situation. You want your sympathetic nervous system to turn on uh, and really get your heart racing, but you need that extra oomph. You need that little bit more help. So if, you're, if you've initiated your sympathetic nervous system, then you're also going to initiate a sympathetic fiber to the adrenal medulla. Okay, so the, that's going to release uh, these uh, amino acid-based hormones, okay, and you're going to get this release of these catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. So this is going to give you short-term increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Uh, you're going to convert glycogen to glucose, so you have more readily available sugar. You're going to dilate the bronchioles, so you can breathe better and get more oxygen in. So if you have more sugar, you have more oxygen, you have more ATP. All right, it's going to change blood flow patterns so that you're going to put more blood to um, the skeletal muscle and the heart and the brain and not the digestive system and urine. You don't have time for that. you you got to get that bus out of the way and increase your metabolic rate. All right, what about long-term stress? Okay, so, you know, that kind of stress where, you know, uh, a death in the family or a divorce or school, <laughs> you know, we're just constantly stressed all the time. Um, in this case, hypothalamus is going to release that CRH, okay, that corticotropin releasing hormone, right, to the anterior pituitary. So this is short term, straight to the sympathetic nervous system, straight to the adrenal medulla, long term. So you're going to have the anterior pituitary release ACTH, okay. The ACTH is going to go to the uh, adrenal cortex, and it's going to uh, secrete hormones like your mineralocorticoids and your glucocorticoids. So in long term stress, going to have uh, retention of sodium and water. Uh, so this is why when people are stressed, their blood pressure may go up. Okay, so you're going to see increased blood pressure and in, in, uh, increased blood volume. So a stressful day at work and, you know, it's, it's, you know, you've got a deadline to meet and your blood pressure is going up. This could be why. All right. Uh, you're going to, proteins and fats are going to be converted to glucose and broken down for energy. You're going to see increased uh, blood sugar levels. Uh, your immune system is going to be suppressed. This is why during finals, this is when everybody gets sick. You're so stressed out, your immune system's down. I know uh, after I would leave Auburn at the end of each semester, or at that time it was quarters, and I was so stressed out, I would always go home and crash for a couple of days and, and wind up with some kind of a cold. Then like, I got sick at the end of every quarter because I was so stressed out uh, during finals. So, um, and that's why. It's your body's response to uh, long-term stress. And that's it. So I hope you're not too stressed out. Uh, don't be. If you'll take some time and study and practice, this won't seem near as scary as it does when you listen to it to the first time. So again, uh, start practicing, start thinking about these pathways, and, um, and you'll be fine. It's just going to take some time and some study. All right. Thanks a lot. And once again, we'll see you again.